And so today we wanted to give you an opportunity to hear from each of our division directors who will be sharing um, a little bit about uh, each division, the work that those divisions engage in, as well as some of the hot issues or topics that they've been managing since we were uh, in front of you last session. Um, Madam Chair, I just want to conclude by saying I do need to leave the committee hearing earlier to get early to get to another appointment. So I'm happy to stand for any questions at this time, or uh, if there are no questions for me before I leave, I'll turn it over to Joe Henderson, who is our director for the Lands and Minerals Division. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, really appreciate you being here today. Um, I think it's ironic that we have worked so hard for so long to get people extra fishing licenses, people out in the outdoors. And now our problem is that they're loving our outdoors and environment <laughs> and, and so much that we uh, have, have different issues. So uh, with that, members, are there any uh, questions? Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Commissioner. <clears throat> I do have three different items that I would like to mention that, that it will fall in front of the uh, policy committee, and they are actually three items that uh, we visited about on your visit to my district uh, two years ago last fall. And, um, you know, one of them deals with uh, the Lake Chautauqua area and the fact that the road leading out to Keeley Island has been termed uh, by experts in the county as the most dangerous stretch of county road. Uh, and we are pursuing funding to get that road redone. However, in order for there to be a safer road, uh, there needs to be shoulders and a pedestrian lane added to that. Um, your agency has been somewhat problematic in terms of you don't wish to give up any lake in order to improve the safety of the road access. Um, you know, I guess I, I would like an update, not necessarily at this committee, but, but privately as to where you are at on that, because if you cannot take care of it administratively, I do intend to take care of it legislatively. Last fall, we had an older couple who left an event uh, at the restaurant out there that drove, there was a sudden rainstorm and they actually drove off the road because there is nothing preventing that from happening. You have the road, you have the rocks going down to the lake as you remember seeing, and that's all there is. And, um, and as I stated to you then, we wish to, we advertise, we spend millions of dollars advertising for people to, to come enjoy their natural resources, and yet we fail to provide for their safety while they're there, and it's time that we took care of some of these issues. Uh, the second one is as it relates to uh, the weed control in lakes. Uh, the area that uh, which control is, is provided for within the state regulations uh, basically covers 100% of most of my shallow prairie lakes. And so in a thousand acre lake, they can only go out and treat 150 acres and that's just not satisfactory. And uh, again, um, I did uh, submit a bill once that uh, no one in your agency liked, but we will go back to that route again if that's what is necessary. And, um, and then the uh, third item uh, that I wish to mention, uh, quite frankly, is uh, the um, uh, issues as it relates uh, to just the normal maintenance of our wildlife management areas. Uh, fortunately, the last two years, we've had more normal rainfall. And uh, so some of those problems don't necessarily come back with as, as much of a vengeance as they do. But uh, I don't think that I've seen anything happen in terms of policy that prevents those issues from reoccurring in the future. And so um, at some point, uh, we need to talk privately, but um, I just wish to mention that uh, these are issues that uh, I do intend for us to address and uh, because quite frankly, the agency has not and um, just wanted to make that point today. Thank you, Senator Weber. Would number four be calcareous fens? Well, actually there's four or five and six, but we'll save the last three for another day. <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, Sen Senator Weber will be happy to, to provide you an update on all of those issues and, and our division directors who uh, work more closely on those issues are here to, to hear your concerns here today. So uh, I saw uh, Assistant Commissioner Meyer taking notes, so we'll make sure we follow up with you on those. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Are there any other questions? With that, thank you. Uh, thank we you. appreciate you being here today. Um, and next up we have Joe Henderson. 
Mr. Henderson, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, committee members, again, I'm Joe Henderson, Division Director for the Division of Lands and Minerals. Uh, before we get uh, into a couple of updates since the last session, I wanted to give you a quick summary of what Lands and Minerals does. Um, advance the slide, sorry. There we go. All right. About half of the division provides real estate leadership and services managing the state's portfolio of 5.6 million acres of state-owned land. We handle everything from hunting shack leases to processing large multi-million dollar land acquisitions to the sale of surplus state lands. The other half of the division is charged with managing 12 million acres of state-owned mineral resources for the benefit of all Minnesotans, including managing mineral leasing, exploration, and mine development. We also manage the Hibbing Core Library. Through our mine permitting programs, we ensure that mineral development is environmentally sound and mined areas are reclaimed for future use. Lands and Minerals employs about 100 people with a little over half located in greater Minnesota in our offices in Hibbing, Bemidji, Brainerd, Grand Rapids, and New Ulm with the remainder in St. Paul. As I mentioned, the Division of Lands and Minerals employs a number of real estate professionals who conduct DNR real estate transactions including the sale of DNR administered surplus state land. The division holds public land sales at least once per year. Historically, the public sales have been held in person at the DNR central office or at a location closer to the lands offered for sale. In 2021, the division began working with the Department of Administration to develop a process to use the MinBid platform, which sells sur to sell surplus state land. MinBid is the online auction platform, which is used to sell state properties such as vehicles and equipment. On July of 2021, the DNR conducted a pilot land sale with MinBid, offering five parcels of school trust land that had previously been offered at public auction, but had not sold. The pilot sale was a success, four out of the five parcels sold, and the total sale amount for the four parcels was 29% higher than the minimum bid amount. In December of 2021, we again used MinBid for a public land auction. The December sale was also a success with 50 bidders participating in the sale. All nine parcels offered received bids and all but one of the parcels received a bid over the minimum amount. The total amount over the minimum, a bid, minimum bid was nearly $500,000, 38%. The DNR is very encouraged by the results of the two MinBid sales we believe that it's an important tool to have available for all future sales. We're optimistic that the use of online sales will make public sales easier, more profitable and more efficient, and will increase public participation in the sales. On the mineral side of the division, Minnesota has a strong iron ore industry. All six of Minnesota's taconite mines are currently operating at capacity. Mines are modernizing and hiring new people. Thanks to iron ore, the US Geological Survey ranks Minnesota number three in metallic mineral production, a ranking Minnesota has held for decades. Over 80% of all the iron ore consumed in North America to make steel is shipped from Minnesota's Mesabi Range. Minnesota has a 132 year history of mining state ore and today's mineral revenues from leases on state lands are historically high. Revenues from school trust lands are benefiting K through 12 education throughout the state. Revenues from university trust lands are benefiting students and programs across all five campuses of the University of Minnesota. And revenues from lands that were previously forfeited for non-payment of taxes are now reaping benefits for local school districts, local counties, and local cities and townships. Last year, fiscal 21's state mineral lease revenues of $35.4 million is above the average annual revenue for the last 10 years. Fiscal 22 revenue continues to be strong. And in fact, fiscal year to date iron ore royalty revenue is over $35 million. On the permitting regulatory oversight side of minerals, last year, active iron ore facilities created a 10 year high for permitting requests. The Division of Lands and Minerals permitting team worked on 25 permit to mine applications and amendments. Additionally, almost all of the taconite operations requested modifications to existing water appropriation permits during the year. In summary, 
Lands and Minerals has been busy. Uh, I will now turn it over to Katie Smith, the Director of the Division of Ecological and Water Services. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Um, are there any other questions for Mr. Henderson? No? Thank you. Appreciate you being here today. Ms. Smith, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed when you're ready. Madam Chair, committee members, good afternoon. My name is Katie Smith and I'm the Director of the Ecological and Water Resources Division at DNR. First, a little bit of background. The DNR's Ecological and Water Resources Division helps realize a vision of healthy lands and waters throughout Minnesota by delivering integrated land and water resource conservation. Consistent with DNR's mission, the division supports sustainable economic development, provides outdoor recreation opportunities, enhances rare wildlife and native plant populations, and protects aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems from the negative impacts of invasive species. The division's customers include individuals, landowners, businesses, outdoor recreation enthusiasts, local governments, conservation groups, and others who live in Minnesota and who visit our state. We organize our ecological and water resources work into three main service categories. First is conservation assistance and regulation services. You'll see a proposal seeking enhancement of our compliance and enforcement authorities this session. Next is ecosystem management and protection services. And I'll be sharing some specific projects from those efforts. And our last category of work is inventory, monitoring and analysis. I'd like to start with the severe drought that Minnesota experienced in 2021 which affected communities, natural resources, agriculture, industry, public utilities, and tourism. The DNR's climatologists collaborated with national experts, including the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, to monitor trends and ensure we had the information needed to manage the situation. And as the drought intensified in July, DNR implemented a number of measures laid out in the statewide drought plan. This included convening the State Drought Task Force a panel of state, federal, regional, and local experts with water-related responsibilities, including tribal representation. Implementation of the drought plan included directing water, public water suppliers to reduce water use, which was generally achieved through lawn watering restrictions. DNR is seeking supplemental budget funds for grants to municipal, township, and tribal governments that operate public water supplies to increase water efficiency and water conservation. DNR also temporarily suspended or modified some lower priority water appropriations in response to low stream flow conditions in order to prioritize domestic water use. The DNR also worked with homeowners to evaluate and assist in assisting in quote unquote out of water situations. DNR is also seeking supplemental funds to assist homeowners with costs associated with these well issues. We'll be continue to monitor conditions and we'll be using feedback from our partners to incorporate what we collectively learned last summer into our statewide drought plan as we look ahead into 2022. Now let's move to non-game wildlife. Dakota skippers are a rare prairie butterfly that is federally threatened and state endangered. They used to be found in western Minnesota prairies and now only remain in one northern gravel prairie. As you can see in the photo, skippers are big-eyed butterflies. They get their name because they appear, appear to skip across the prairie as they zip from flower to flower. And they need healthy, diverse, connected remnant prairies to survive. And the Minnesota Zoo and DNR have been working together since 2017 to reintroduce skippers at Hole in the Mountain Preserve in Lincoln County, which is owned by the Nature Conservancy. In 2021, the Minnesota Zoo, Zoo U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and DNR expanded the reintroduction by releasing approximately 500 Dakota skippers into the Hole in the Mountain Wildlife Management Area and 500 at Altoona Wildlife Management Area. Another key participant is an area farmer who has helped manage the grasslands of Hole in the Mountain WMA by having his cattle, cattle graze that wildlife management area. And partnerships are truly what make these kinds of projects successful. Now I'd like to tell you about the significant progress DNR has made in 2021 in the St. Louis River Restoration Initiative. We completed three large projects to restore degraded fish and wildlife habitat in the St. Louis River estuary under the Great Lakes Area of Concern program. In total, the three projects restored approximately 238 acres of habitat. 
At Interstate Island, the DNR restored critical habitat for the common tern that had been under threat from rising water levels. Grassy Point, the former, former site of turn of the century sawmills, was restored by remo removing legacy wood waste from the water and restoring shallow sheltered bay habitat. And at Kingsbury Bay, the DNR restored coastal marsh habitat by dredging decades of accumulated sediment and removing invasive plants. These three projects took multiple years and many state, federal, and local partners to develop and implement. Next, I want to share information on a bait harvest pilot project. Now, the DNR supports both local minnow production and the prevention of the spread of aquatic invasive species. So we're exploring revisions to the current minnow harvest permit conditions to allow for both of these goals. Minnow dealers have expressed that current permit conditions are affecting their ability to harvest minnows. Specifically, the gear restriction and closed season have been identified as permit conditions that have caused hardships and make some waters unharvestable. During 2021, the DNR convened meetings with tribal governments and commercial bait harvesters for their perspectives and input to work together to better understand the bait harvest process and to propose ways to mitigate the risk of aquatic invasive species transfer during that process. The outcome of this has been the creation of a pilot project to allow bait harvest with additional gear types, such as hard-sided traps in zebra mussel infested waters. DNR staff are working with commercial bait harvesters and tribal governments to finalize the pilot project, including pilot locations, which will be implemented in the 2022 open water season. Finally, I want to share that the DNR led two intensive invasive carp removal efforts in Pool 8 of the Upper Mississippi River near La Crescent, Minnesota. The removal efforts used the innovative Modified Unified Method, or MUM, which combines netting and herding techniques to drive and concentrate invasive carp from a large area of water into a small zone for removal. The DNR conducted this work in partnership with the Wisconsin DNR, the U.S. Geological Survey, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The effort focused on Pool 8 because numerous invasive carp have been discovered there in the past, as well as in areas downstream. We continue to refine our operation to account for temperature, nets, and equipment to be as effective as possible. The goal is to remove invasive carp, curb the potential for invasive carp reproduction, and prevent their establishment in Minnesota and Wisconsin waters. Next, I'd like to turn it over to Forrest Bold, Director of, Director of the Forestry Division. Thank you. Are there any questions? Senator Weber. Thank you. Um, one question, uh, Ms. Smith, uh, regarding the, the uh, Dakota skipper reintroduction, those sites that you mentioned are in my district. So how much time do you give to, uh, to evaluate the success and how do you go about counting the number of uh, butterflies are there short of sending Assistant Commissioner Meyer out to be trekking through the fields there? Yeah, the, your, your people all laugh at that, Assistant Commissioner. But anyway, um, uh, so I'm just curious how that, how that is, is oversaw and, and what the results are, are, how they're determined. Ms. Smith. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Weber, um, we'll continue to monitor those sites um, our regional staff, um, who are uh, specialists in, in this type of work, go out there frequently. And as I mentioned, we have those great partnerships with the Minnesota Zoo. Um, and so our regional ecologists will work with those folks, the area farmer. Um, like I said, it's a great partnership and they'll continue to monitor that, to um, review the populations, review the, um, the status of the prairie out there and ensure that these species continue to thrive. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair, and and I would the whole the mountain nature, uh, nature reserve area there that encompasses how many acres actually? Do you know offhand? It's quite a few actually. Ms. Smith, uh, Madam Chair, um, Senator Weber, I'm not exactly sure. Um, maybe my uh, colleague uh, Director Olfelt can help me with that question, but it is it is fairly sizable? Yes, I, I actually went out there and got to witness it myself, which was a great experience. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Sengem. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Smith, uh, I just have a, a, a very general question. I'm kind of looking for a general answer. Uh, all of us, almost on a continual basis, uh, get emails that say, go to St. Paul and improve water quality. If you look at, say, the last decade, uh, where are we in terms of water quality? Is it, is it 
are we getting better? Are we about the same or getting worse? Ms. Smith. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator, um, you know, that's something that we continue to monitor um, with more and more data that we have um, together with our other state agencies. It's something that we continue to collect and review and to um, take that data into account when we're doing our permits, our watershed planning, um, working with other agencies, et cetera. So in, in some areas, I think we see improvements. In some areas, as we continue to collect information, we find um, new information that indicates that maybe there's a downward trend. So I think it's really specific to certain areas and the kinds of pressures that, that they're receiving. And we continue to modify our work around those, those areas. Senator Sanders. So thank you, Madam Chair. So I sense you're not able to answer that. I mean, it's, it's either getting better or it's getting worse. There's no neutral. Uh, and I understand it, you know, some one river might be getting better and one, one might be getting worse, but but we spend millions of dollars on this issue, uh, most especially in the wastewater infrastructure and our bonding committees every year, and, and certainly other, you know, all the clean water legacy money and so on. Are, are we able to say that that money is not achieving a lot? Because I think that's what you're telling me. <laughs> Ms. Smith. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator, um, I think overall, if we look past um, decades and decades of work that we've done, we've definitely seen improvements in water quality. I think it's a little bit more complicated answer if, if we look at the specific um, lake or river, et cetera, and maybe what's grown up around it um, to get more specific on that. But I'd say overall, yes, we've been very successful in improving water quality across the state. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Herr. Um, Madam Chair, it's good to be back and I just thought I insert in, um, send my colleague, Senator Sen Sen uh, Senjum mentioned about St. Paul. I, I can't give a thorough answer and I'm not the uh, water quality expert, but I, I can testify a little bit on behalf of Phelan Lake because that's in my district. And uh, in 2021 of uh, July, uh, uh, a group of students from the University of Minnesota came and tested salt level and they seem to um, have data that prove that uh, water quality at Lake Phelan has gotten a little bit better. So if I thank can you, Senator. add that in, thank you. Are there other questions? Thank you, Ms. Smith, appreciate it. Uh, up next, I, Forrest Bow. welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the tape and proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Uh, for the record, my name is Forrest Bow. I'm the Director of Forestry with Minnesota DNR. Glad to be here today. Uh, I wanted to introduce you a little bit to the Division of Forestry. Uh, of course, we take care of uh, wildfires in, in the state. We both uh, do prevention and suppression of those wildfires. We manage uh, the state lands, include, including school trust lands. And we do a lot of work with uh, communities and private landowners. For sustainable forest management, it really starts uh, at, our, at our state forest nursery. And so we grow seedlings at the nursery. We get those in the ground. They, we grow and we tend those forests uh, through their lifetime. Uh, we also man, uh, monitor all forests across the state for forest health issues. Think about emerald ash borer and, and some of the other forest pests. Uh, we also monitor for invasive species across all ownerships. Eventually, timber becomes mature on state lands and we do a timber harvest. And so the cycle starts all over again with us planting trees. When it comes to private landowners, we assist them to be, to be great stewards of the private lands. And uh, we help them with their projects through some cost share programs. We also assist urban and community uh, forest programs with shade trees, emerald ash borer grants, and, uh, and so much more. This past season, we, have, we were very, very busy with uh, uh, wildfire suppression. We had uh, uh, a season that went way beyond normal. Normally, our fire season here in Minnesota is March, April, and May, pretty much over uh, probably by the third week of May and most years. This year, it didn't quit. We went into July, August, 
uh, uh, June, July, August, and into September before we got finally got some relief. And so just to kind of put things in perspective, uh, we had 2,200 fires statewide and, uh, and our five-year average is 1,200 fires a year. So many, many yeah. more fires. And with the drought this year, the fires that uh, we had in that June, July, August, and September uh, period were much, much more difficult to put out, requiring a lot of extra resources. To kind of put things in perspective, again, one of the things I always look at is how many aircraft did we have in the state and how many missions did we run with our aircraft? On an average, we run about um, uh, 180 aircraft flights over, over fires on an, on an average year. This last year, we had over 900 aircraft flights or drops on fires. So very uh, a significant increase to that. Of course, we can't have, we can't handle all of that um, on our own. And so we expand by bringing in resources through other states. We had 14 different states and two provinces help us throughout much of our season this year. We're uh, involved uh, or we support uh, a national system whereby in many years, most years, we are the ones that are helping other states. And thankfully, uh, they returned the favor this last year. And so that was uh, a really, really good piece of work. Looking ahead, 2022, um, you know, the majority of our state remains even today in abnormally dry or moderate drought conditions. And as a matter of fact, our conditions today are worse than they were a year ago at this time. So uh, we're, ho we're hoping and praying for lots of rain and lots of snow and, uh, and a good wet spring. Um, the uh, records would show that the, that the 2021 season was similar to that of 1976. So these don't come around all the time, but uh, that's, that's how bad we had it this year. It was a significant fire season. On state lands, we harvest about 40,000 acres of timber annually. And about three quarters of those acres or those trees come back naturally through re-sprouting. That requires us to have to plant or seed about 10,000 acres annually, requiring two to three million seedlings annually. And growing trees after harvest, again, is required and really requires a lot of planning and sustained funding. There's also opportunities to replant areas where forests once, forests once grew. Uh, reforestation has is, is been identified as the natural climate solution with the highest mitigation potential. In 2021, drought threatened years of reforestation and shade tree plantings on city, county, state, and tribal lands and private lands. On state lands, we see 60 to 100% seedling mortality on recently planted sites in central and northern Minnesota. So tree, links, tree seedling supply is an issue for us. These large scale uh, production increases are needed to grow enough seedlings for the reforestation that we need after harvest. The drought response, in other words, planting seedlings again on, on all of those uh, seedling areas that uh, had the mortality, and also uh, to combat climate mitigation or to, to provide climate mitigation. Communities suffered loss of young trees and significant damage to shade trees as well. It just wasn't these small uh, seedlings out in the forest and funding is needed to help uh, communities and with the grants that we provide and also to private landowners. All to say that planting and replacing seedlings and shade trees is needed for future forest products, for carbon storage, for wildlife habitat, for water quality, and our urban canopy. I'll take any questions, otherwise I will pass it on 
to the next director. Thank you, members, other questions? Um, Mr. Bow, I think um, um, down the road, um, Senator Weber man, uh, mentioned this also on the WMAs, and I think we would like to have a really good conversation um, on, on that with you um, going forward about uh, planning and, and doing some really good master planning on the, on the WMAs. That's uh, an issue that's come before us, and I, Senator Weber brought it up, and I think um, it would be really good if we could have a great conversation, and you're welcome in our offices at any time to do that. So thank you today. Uh, with that, that. Um, Mr. Ofelt, I believe you're next for Actually, it's Ann. Does Ann want to come Marshall first? Trails next, Madam Chair, so. yeah. All right. Welcome, Ms. Pierce. Uh, please identify yourself for the record and start when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee. I'm Ann Pierce. I'm the director for Parks and Trails. And I think because our slides were in this order, we just oh. <laughs> thought it'd be easier to have me come up. <laughs> so um, I am gonna give you a little bit of highlights from this past year in the Parks and Trails division. And as you all are probably very familiar, Parks and Trails, really aspires to create those unforgettable parks, trails, and water recreation experiences that inspire people of Minnesota um, to pass along that love for the outdoors and outdoor recreation to current and future generations. And in doing so, we divide our work into basically three major categories. So we think about connecting people to the outdoors through like I said, parks, trails, forest recreational areas, and water recreation. To do this, we need to think about acquiring lands and creating new recreational and conservation opportunities for people and connecting with partners to provide that seamless outdoor recreational system that Minnesota really does have. Um, I'm gonna give you some highlights from each of these categories as we went throughout the year. So to begin with, I'm gonna start with um, looking at our outdoor recreation and how important, I think Commissioner Strauman mentioned this, but what we really realized over the last two years and with in face of the pandemic is that Minnesotans really sought the outdoors for their health and wellness. Um, and the benefits of that recreation provided them as they worked through the pandemic over the last two years. And this really, for I think for everybody, underscored the value um, Minnesotans place on that vast outdoor recreational opportunities that, that we have here in the state. And just to give you a sense of what that looks like, in 2021, there were over 11.5 million uh, visits to state parks with over 1,180,000 overnight visits. And so to put that in perspective, um, the overnight visits to state parks and forest recreational areas increased by 24% and 18% respectively um, over that year. State park annual permits Sales also increased, and in 2021, they were up 44% to, compared to 2019, and even up 5% from 2020. While our, our daily permit decreased slightly, slightly from 2020, it was still up substantially compared to 2019. In addition, at those parks and those other um, recreational areas, we saw retail sales increased over 7% from 2019. And registrations for things like watercraft, off-highway vehicles, and snowmobiles have all increased in 2020 and 2021. And to think about our, our paved trail system, that serves over 1.2 million um, visitors each summer. 
And along with some of these increases and changes that we've seen, we've also seen that our patterns have slightly changed. So people are uh, really focusing on not only the summer um, months, but also moving into the spring and late fall times when they're really focusing on, on using a lot of these trail systems and our park systems. And this, of course, sometimes can create challenges for our traditional seasonal staffing model that we have for parks and trails. Um, we can continue to adapt though with this increased number of visitors. Of course, we want to make their visits as seamless as possible. And what we have been looking at is really increasing and advancing in that self-service model to allow for people to be coming in even on those off hours where we might not have people staffing to, to get them registered and things like that, but they have the opportunity to do so with these self-registration models. Um, a number of the other directors, Director Smith and Director Bo also mentioned the drought this year. And that again, did impact our Parks and Trails Division and the department as a whole. Um, we, worked quite a bit with uh, low water issues because of the drought, created impacts at our public water access sites, and um, it exacerbated some of the issues that we're seeing with larger boats and extending ramps to get into those lake systems. We worked quite extensively with lake associations to address some of these concerns of the public water access and try to mediate for some of those. And we also managed um, to make sure that our communications was up to date so that visitors knew what the re what was happening at those sites and they could follow guidelines that were quite that were relatively clear. Um, this continues to uh, highlight some of those needs for rehabilitation and modernization of our public water access sites that occur naturally over time. Um, we continue to, to try to understand what the boating public's needs are as they change throughout time. And in doing so, we carry out the ongoing water recreation surveys just to get information about what the boating public is looking for and what those needs are. In addition to dealing with low water issues, um, Director Bo mentioned the wildfire um, issues that occurred over the growing season and parks and trails staff um, assisted in a lot of those efforts. We did experience and implement many of the fire restrictions throughout the state, including campfires and campsite closures. And parks and trails staff also played a critical role in fighting wildfires, um, helping partner with the Division of Forestry. And we provided 732 days of fire assistant and 581 of those days were initial attack responses. Moving into um, thinking about our acquired lands and development and maintaining those assets that we have, um, Parks and Trails is responsible for managing capital assets including uh, buildings, roads, trails, bridges, water and sewer systems, water control structures, and campsites. And some examples of things that we accomplished this year include um, the Shipwreck Creek Campground at Split Rock Lighthouse State Park. We have now 46 campsites and those campsites all have electricity um, with a modern energy efficient shower building. And the grand opening of that is going to be this spring sometime and in 2022. Um, new state trail segments and bridges were all accomplished over this last year, including Glacial Lake State Trail at Sibley State Park, the Heartland State Trail near um, Detroit Lakes, Ichigami State Trail near Grand Marais, and 13 other trail bridge rehab and replacement efforts that occurred over last year. Um, we also continue to do conservation efforts and just a small example of, of that is that we reconstructed, reconstructed and restored over a thousand acres of prairie 
forest and wetlands, providing additional habitat for pollinators and rare species such as a butterfly called the regal fritillaris, timber rattlesnakes, and the rusty patch bumblebee. Um, we also replaced a non-compliant wastewater treatment pond at Itasca State Park. And now that is in current, comes up to standards for current environmental standards and is helping protect the groundwater at Itasca State Park. Another highlight of this year is that we continue to expand the Cuna uh, recreational area and we opened an additional 10 miles of new mountain biking trails in 2021 with another 15 miles and a new trailhead facility for the Sagamore unit to be opened in 2022. The Sagamore unit uh, facility includes 8.7 miles of adapted hand cycle mountain bike trails and a first at Cuyuna. Um, and this opens up mountain biking for people of all abilities. And upon completion of, the recre of that recreational area, it will have over nearly 50 miles of mountain biking trails in it. Um, taking care of all these assets are important to the state and to the department. And it's an ongoing investment, which um, is estimated to be over $100 million per year. Another area where we are focusing on is our continued continuation of encouraging new people to enjoy the out, outdoors and making our outdoor recreational opportunities available to everyone in Minnesota. And just a few examples of some of the highlights from some of those efforts include um, a the implementation of a state parks library pass program, which was launched um, in 2021. And this provides library patrons the ability to check out a park, a parks pass for one week so that they can go to a park for free for one week. It's at 71 different libraries. And in the first year of implementation, we had 1,500 uh, of those passes checked out. Another area that we've been focusing on is our interpretive services and Parks and Trails continues to advance the inclusive opportunities for these interpret interpretive efforts, including working at um, a project called Lake Burbingi Go App, which was launched this year, which provides a virtual interpretation through a mobile phone app. Uh, the Lake Bemidji app, Go app, sorry, um, interprets the resources and the sites of Lake Bemidji State Park and is incorporating the Ojibwe language into that program. And a new visitor center at St. Croix State Park this year, which includes Ojibwe history. And we engaged early on with the Mille Lacs Band to help develop that, um, that history and present also, this is presented in accessible design so that um, it has audio description and things like that for people that can have multiple points of access for that. So with that, if there are any questions, I can answer those. Otherwise, I will hand it over to Dave Opelt, our Director of Fish and Wildlife. Members, are there questions? Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Pierce, uh, one of the questions I have is, um, as it relates to some of our trails. Um, in my district, the Casey Joan Trail starting out of Pipestone is the first trail that was started by the state of Minnesota. And yet it's hardly gotten anywhere. It languishes in terms of its uh, length, in terms of its improvement. Um, and uh, we do have made a request to the bonding committee uh, for, for monies, uh, but how many of these trails do we have that the state has started and quite frankly has literally abandoned um, in, in terms of making them progress? The, the plan originally was grandiose, obviously. It was intended to go all the way up to Walnut Grove uh, to where the Laura Ingalls Wilder pageant is and what have you. But, um, you know, they've never gotten out of Pipestone, Murray County, to be honest about it. So. Um, 
what is the plan for the, by the DNR for these trails that are just allowed to languish? Director Pierce. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So, you know, I can look into that trail specifically and see what those issues are surrounding it. But as you can imagine, as trails are being placed on the landscape, there's multiple factors going into land availability, acquisition, trying to do all the review that goes along with that. And as those things continue to move forward and may run into complications, they end up delaying these projects. I don't know the specifics about the trail that you're talking about, but I can certainly find that out and see what the issues are. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would just say that, that this trail was started well over 40 years ago. So um, there may be problems from time to time, but they have a very active uh, citizen group that uh, continues to pursue it. And uh, um, I guess, at some point, I think that it requires support from the state of Minnesota in order to make some of those things happen. Mm -hmm. Now, I also understand that uh, perhaps sometimes, uh, <clears throat> this is my 10th year here, I've seen trails proposed and put in place fairly quickly, and maybe it depends upon the, uh, the political might of one individual or another. But uh, I think that, um, you know, I, I would very much appreciate you taking a look at this one and uh, and seeing what we can do. I would be happy to do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Members, are there other questions? Senator Swidinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's been too long since I've been able to say that. Um, <laughs> That library idea, so you go to a library in Minnesota, you can get a 10-day pass to a, a state park. A, a five-day pass. Five-day pass. I'm pretty sure it's a five-day pass, but yes. Whoever idea that was, um, make sure they get some kind of a day off or something. That's an awesome, awesome program. So little kids go to the library and find out about this program. Next thing you know, mom and dad are taking the kids to the park. Uh, exactly. Thank you for doing that. Yes. I agree. Thank you, Senator Swedinski. Are there other questions? Thank you, Director Pierce. Up next, Thank you now, Mr. Olfeld. Good afternoon and welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the tape and proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Senators. Uh, my name is Dave Olfeld, and I serve as the director of the Division of Fish and Wildlife. Thank you. There you go. Oh. Oh, yeah. And Madam Chair and Senator Weber, I, I talked to my friend Google in, after you asked your question of Director Smith. Uh, Hole in the Mountain Wildlife Management Area is about 640 acres and the Nature Conservancy Preserve is about 1,300 acres. So it is, a, it is a sizable chunk of land. Again, thank you for the chance to uh, come and visit me this afternoon. We in the Division of Fish and Wildlife work with Minnesotans to sustain healthy populations of fish and wildlife, high quality recreational opportunities and vibrant local economies. And I'd like to give you some examples and highlights of that work from the past year. Um, in our populations work, uh, we put in place a new survey protocol for the serious fish disease, let's see if I can say it here, viral hemorrhagic septicemia or VHS. Uh, the practical implications of that new survey protocol are that it is now much easier to move fish around in Minnesota, uh, including bait fish. So bait fish are more available as, as a result of that work. Uh, we also made significant improvements to our Lanesboro and New London fish hatcheries, uh, increasing efficiencies and effectiveness of those facilities. And uh, we resumed full fish, fish production at our other hatcheries after a pandemic related pause. And we continued our deer movement studies in southeastern Minnesota and the northern part of the state to improve our understanding of how deer use the landscape. Land protection and management is key. And last year, with the help of our conservation partners, uh, DNR added about 3,500 acres of land to the wildlife management area system and our aquatic management area system. And additionally, about three and a half miles of 
trout stream easements for angling access. And we strive, we continue to actively manage our prairies, wetlands, forests, and lakes, streams to sustain healthy and productive fish and wildlife habitat. Connecting people to the outdoors is a big part of what we are about. And hunting and fishing are an important part of the fabric of Minnesota. We had more than a million and a half people uh, buy fishing licenses last year, and more than 550,000 people buy hunting licenses last year. Those are individuals and not, not the licenses themselves. So it's a significant number of people in the state. And getting people the licenses and titles they need is also a big job. And our license center supports the work of 500 license agents, 250 deputy registrars and the online system that Minnesotans use to gain access to licenses and titles. We also work directly with customers to meet licensing needs and address sticky issue, uh, the, the sticky issues license agents or, registers, or deputy registrars can't solve. Chronic wasting disease, as you all know, is a significant issue in Minnesota. Uh, managing, it's controlling its geographic spread and uh, prevalence continues to be a high priority for us in the DNR. Testing of hunter harvested deer has been key to this work. DNR staff sampled almost 15,000 deer last fall. Of those 32 tested positive, we had good compliance, almost 70% of hunters in um, the zones where we had mandatory surveillance uh, complied with, with the requirements. Importantly, um, most of our control and surveillance areas had no positive deer. This is still a disease that is uh, focused mostly in the Southeast. We had a total of, as I said, 32 deer test positive. One of those positives was in the Brainerd area. The other was uh, near uh, the South of East Grand Forks. The other big, uh, big task that we undertook this year was uh, beginning concurrent management of whitetail deer farms with the Board of Animal Health. We began this work in July. We had lots of learning, but good partnering with the Board of Animal Health. DNR staff were on 50 farm visits. We worked out data sharing with the board. And last week we delivered a report to the legislature, to you all with findings and recommendations. I'd like to spend just a minute talking a little bit more about how we we're helping Minnesotans to get outdoors. This last, in this last year, we, uh, we continued and we ramped up our outdoor skills and stewardship series, which is on a weekly noontime webinar hosted by the DNR and highlighting an outdoor uh, experience or skill. Um, we translated the fishing and hunting regulations books into Spanish, Hmong, Karen and Somali and distributed them in meaningful places around the state. We developed and posted a new interactive stream finder web map, web page that helps people find great places to fish for trout. And that's the image on the slide here. If you go to the DNR website, you click on that, it will zoom you in a dip to a part of the state. You can click on a, a stream segment. You can see what kinds of fish are there, what trout are there. Where the, where the public access is. It's a really, really cool tool that just got unrolled this last year. Um, last session, DNR was again appropriated funds to deliver no child left inside grants. Uh, new grants are rolling out to organizations right now. And the program has broad reach. We now have 1400 contacts across, Minnesotans, across Minnesota uh, for organizations who are interested in the program. We're continuing to support the walk-in access program. This is a program that pays landowners to allow access for hunting. We renewed a grant with the, the, the U.S. Department of Agriculture to help fund the program, and we had about 30,000 acres of farmland enrolled last fall. And finally, our aquatic and wildlife management areas are cornerstones of the outdoor recreation system in Minnesota. They provide quality fish and wildlife habitat and access for hunting, angling, and nature-based recreation. Thank you all for your support and your interest, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you. Are there questions? Um, I just have one. Um, 
I know that um, as Mr. Olfeld, when the when the pandemic hit, we did not do um, harvesting of the eggs and, and growing the walleyes, yes. if I'm correct. And so um, with that, we've kind of lost a year. And now I think we're, we've, we've noticed that the fry are not doing well in for walleye with the AIS problem. Are we going to have like a supply chain problem where we will, we're going to have um, when we're the fish stocking um, because we, we are actually missing a year of, of growing fish. Are we going to be able to um, make that up else? I mean, with other states or, or how are we going to, so I think there is a going to be a gap there. Madam Chair, I'll do I'll do my best to answer. I'm a, I'm a wildlife guy, not a fish guy. Um, <laughs> but last year, as as you as you already know, uh, we we took a year off because of the pandemic. And last year, we had a very successful uh, egg harvesting year. So we 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 harvested more to to make up some of that difference. Uh, we made up some of the difference the prior the, the prior year. Uh, by uh, harvesting some, we had carryover in, in some of our fish ponds. And so we did some stocking of, of larger fish later in the year. So there was a little bit of makeup from that. And I think our planning allows us to, to, uh, to acquire more fry in the spring and then, you know, and then adjust as needed. It's, it's not a, a lock and stone kind of a, of a process. So, um, but in terms of, of um, the effects of aquatic invasives on fry. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. Um, and and hopefully we can um, get some bonding dollars for their those hatcheries that that that, 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 yeah, that, that are wonderful. greatly in need of uh, updating. So, you want from Madam Chair. Um, Senator Senjum. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair and Mr. Ofeld. Uh, so I don't, I don't know this in great detail, but, but I know there's, I believe there's a lot of activity down Southeast of Minnesota uh, tr trying to, if you will, shoot our way out of the CW, the disease issue. Uh, and maybe, maybe you uh, noted this in your comments, but do you have any idea how many deer we've, we've taken in that effort at this point? For instance, how many may have tested positive? Where, where are we on that? Uh, and that initiative. Madam Chair, Senator, this, this, or, or if you can, we can we can get another day if you don't there's, have it. There's there's plenty to talk about there. We'd be happy to talk in, in lots of detail at another time. This last year, there were 30 deer from the Twin Cities Southeast that tested positive for chronic wasting disease. I think our total since 2016 is around 120 deer have tested positive, and most of those are in the Southeast. Um, we are, one of the tools we use to manage populations is we have uh, deer goals, population goals for, for different deer permit areas or different harvest blocks. And we work uh, with, with uh, all different kinds of stakeholders to help decide what the appropriate number of deer in a particular part of the landscape is. Uh, we, are, we are embarking that work in Southeastern Minnesota this winter um, so I think that'll help address concerns about shooting our way out of the problem. We, we have been a little bit more liberal with our harvest regulations, and then we have engaged with um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture or Wildlife Services to do some targeted, we call it targeted culling in particular places, in those places close to where we detect positive, um, you know, positive deer in the wild, because the disease tends to, to uh, um, be prevalent in, in family groups. So if we get one positive, there tend to be more positives around there, around that one. And so by targeting some, some subsequent harvest or culling, we're, we're aiming to keep the prevalence down and keep the disease from spreading. The prevalence is still very, very low in Southeastern Minnesota. It's less than, it's about a half of a percent of the deer who, that carry it. So okay. I think that our management is, is being effective at keeping, keeping at a very low rate. Senator Thank you. Thank you. Um, and members and Senator Sendum, um, last week a report came out and it's very um, informative on the concurrent um, uh, um, association between the Board of Animal Health and the DNR and um, staff can get that uh, for you. Um, it's a very good report on how we're going, how we're moving forward with the, the management of CWD. So if you'd like that, um, 
uh, I'm sure um, Ms. Hendricks can get you that report. It's very good reading. With that, thank you. I appreciate thank you, Madam you. Chair. Uh, and who uh, is up Colonel, next? Colonel Robin Smith. Is All right. Next. Colonel Smith, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed when you're ready. For the record, uh, Colonel Rodman Smith, Director of Enforcement, Department of Natural Resources. Madam Chair, members, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, they only gave me one slide, so this will be a little quicker. Um, <laughs> that is Conservation Officer Julie Seams and her partner Brady doing AIS detection work. So. Um, Conservation officers are the primary conservation law enforcement agency in the state of Minnesota. We have an important role connecting people to the outdoors while conserving and enhancing our natural resources. Um, we do this basically through three, three legs of the stool, outreach, safety education, and law enforcement throughout the state. Some of the main services we provide are game and fish education, protection and enforcement, recreational safety and enforcement, natural resource protection and enforcement, and then obviously uh, a broader umbrella of, of public safety. So a couple of highlights I wanted to, to share with you folks today is, you know, since the pandemic, basically in 2019, you can see we added about 18,000 watercraft registrations uh, in the state, which brings us to about 830,000 registered watercraft in Minnesota. Um, I know Minnesotans like to know where we rank all the time, and so on anything. And so we, uh, we kind of have a uh, border battle with Wisconsin between fourth and fifth. We go back and forth every year. And so we're right now, I believe we're about 200 short of Wisconsin. So we're fifth in the nation on registered watercraft. And something important to note on that is those are just Minnesota titled boats. That does not include all the non-residents that come into the state. And so with that increase in, in watercraft usage, um, there's some challenges. We had the highest number of boating fatalities this year since 2005. Um, we're starting to see immense pressure at our public accesses, um, overuse, and some of them is, is some of them are falling into a little bit of disrepair, which is a good thing because they're being used so much. Um, but we're also starting to see um, some user to user conflict and then some user to, to shoreline owner conflict as well with those folks, with the number of people that are uh, on the water. Um, another thing we did uh, this last year of note is uh, we work concurrently with DNR Wildlife and the Board of Animal Health on the concurrent authority on Whitetail Deer Farm. And so that report um, is out as Madam Chair mentioned and we look forward to having conversations about that report. And then uh, there are a number of recommendations in that report that the DNR put forward. And hopefully we can have a conversation about those as well at a later date. Um, we worked with our fishery staff, uh, concentrating on some of our special regulation lakes. Uh, the last couple of years have really seen a boom in winter fishing, especially when it comes to uh, wheelhouses. And there are a lot of destination lakes, uh, such as Mille Lacs, Red Lake, Lake of the Woods, and others that, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable if you haven't seen it, the number of people that caravan up there on a weekend, any given weekend to fish. And so there's a lot of fishing pressure on those. That also is great to see uh, people getting into the outdoors, but it also creates a little bit of conflict and some issues um, uh, with wheelhouses, especially around uh, uh, brown water dumping on the lake, um, basically their septics and some other litter issues that we have um, that we've been addressing. So this last year, we also assisted our, uh, our, our friends in wild, uh, fisheries, or excuse me, in forestry uh, with the wildfires across the Northern part of the state. They did most of the heavy lifting, but uh, we had a number of officers assisting with that as well. And finally, uh, some more good news with all the challenges we've had in the last year, um, we were still able to get over 49,000 students through some type of safety education program, whether it's firearm safety, ATV, snowmobile safety, uh, watercraft safety. Um, that number is extremely impressive. And it's not the DNR that should be taking the credit for that because we do that through 6,000 volunteer instructors throughout the state. And so um, we like to say that the students are the future 
of the outdoors, but really it's those instructors that are teaching those students that are also really the future uh, of our outdoors and participation. So with that, I'll stand for questions. Thank you. Members, other questions? Senator Sinjum. Well, not a question, Madam Chair, maybe just a comment. And maybe this, uh, maybe our Senate's already done this uh, and I'm just one member, but uh, you know, you, you folks, in addition to all the, what you're really supposed to do, uh, also provided, you know, provided a fair amount of security around our capital and so on over the last year and a half. And uh, just know that that didn't go unnoticed. Uh, we really appreciate that kind of an effort. And uh, that's above and beyond the call of normal duty, but uh, it was noticed and appreciated. Thank you, Senator Sinjim. Well said. Thank you. And I believe next we have Mr. Cruz. Is that Director Cruz? Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Committee members, my name is Greg Cruz. I'm the operation or Acting Operation Services Division Director. Um, I'd like to introduce you to the Operation Services Division. Uh, you're probably going to hear a little bit of repeat of some of the information that's already already been provided since our division is an uh, integral part of the services that are provided uh, within our, our department. We provide department wide operational support and statewide regional leadership services for the DNR, providing our workforce with support infrastructure management and resources needed to carry out the DNR's mission and agency goals. Uh, some of those some of those support services include asset services such as fleet buildings, maintenance of those buildings and the management of them, material management, design and construction, finance and planning, internal audit, communications, outreach and data governance, human resources, safety and emergency management outside of wildfire, and coordinate with uh, minute services at the DNR as well. I'd like to take an opportunity and just uh, go over um, the volunteers that we have for, for our, our department and uh, just tell you a little bit about them. Uh, Colonel Smith had already mentioned a significant number of volunteers that provide, provide uh, firearm safety and, and other activities for us. Uh, the department has approximately on average 23,000 volunteers uh, a year and a year and they provide about 367 thousand uh, hours uh, and and contribute about seven million dollars annually to the services for the state of Minnesota to the, the outdoors. They provide essential assistance to our parks, state forest campgrounds, helping us to build trails and assist campers at as campground hosts. As uh, Colonel Smith mentioned, we have safety instruction safety instructors as volunteers for firearms AT ATVs and snowmobiles, and they check docks for zebra mussels as well. Um, they also help us as citizen scientists, monitoring and collecting lake levels at about 1,000 lakes across the state and rainfall information all across the state as well. This information um, was critically important to us in this last, this, uh, this last summer as uh, Director Katie Smith had, had mentioned for the drought. Uh, the monitoring of the lake levels and rainfall information is invaluable to the state in monitoring those conditions. And it also provides long-term records for us uh, to evaluate and track the influences of climate change in the future and how that may impact the state's agriculture, water supplies, and recreation. When we when rehabilitating replace and replacing buildings or features, the DNR strives to make them more welcoming to all Minnesotans, including bringing them to into compliance for ADA requirements. And this includes accessible entrances, widened walkways, gradual gradients, and access, accessible docks as well. In renewable energy, we're also increasing our renewable energy and currently have about 40 renewable energy systems placed around the state. And um, we have an additional four slotted for construction this year.
Operation Services Division provides the all hazard emergency response for our department outside of wildfire. And that includes um, oversight and support for the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the operation support included uh, included uh, safety equipment and safety guidance that allowed our staff to maintain critical services to the public and the state's natural resources. Operations services support also coordinated requests for staff and materials from our department and equipment support for other agencies, including Homeland Security, Department of Health, and MMB. Uh, managing our capital assets, uh, in addition to natural assets, we manage the DNRs. We manage over 1,000 built capital assets, including buildings, bridges, roads, trails, and in fact, the department manages more built infrastructure infrastructure than uh, other state agencies, excluding the University of Minnesota. DNR manages about $3 billion worth of built capital assets with deferred maintenance backlogs of $682 million. The Walls Flanagan Local Jobs Project Plan will help address these challenges and rehabilitate the infrastructure and invest in DNR's assets into the future and help serve the current and future generations of Minnesota. And I'm available for questions if you have any. Thank you. Members, are there any questions? It looks like you're the one that makes this all work, right? All... <laughs> That's really a pretty amazing uh, portfolio of things that you do for, uh, for the DNR. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. With that, um, Deputy Assistant Commissioner, I always say deputy, why do I do that? Uh, Assistant Commissioner Bob Meyer, um, any closing comments uh, today? Madam Chair, as you can see from my colleagues' presentations, the work that we've done and they've accomplished this past year is, is humbling for me to sit here and listen to all they've done. It, it just, it's great for us to be able to share that with you. And it's, it's just a, a great pleasure to be here in front of your committee again in person. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for allowing us to make sure everything works as we move forward this session. And we look forward to being with you in person as much as possible for these conversations. I can stand for any questions. Are there any questions? Senator Herr. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, uh, I'd like to ask um, our Assistant Commissioner a uh, question. You know, during, during the temp pandemic over the last year or so, is there more growth in outdoor participation uh, versus uh, several years ago? Mr. Mayor. Madam Chair, Senator Herb. Yes, we've been seeing great strides in, in uh, everything we've been doing. Our, our camping, as we've seen, our motorized, motorized recreation, our hunting and fishing has remained stable and has increased. And we continue to provide out opportunities to address more new people, bring new people into outdoor recreation as well. So we're really excited about that. And um, any ideas that you all have for us to continue increasing that, we're more than happy to discuss. We'd love to hear from you. Okay. I just thought I'd you know, ask a question just to get a positive note out there. And I know it's, this is challenging time too, although you know we're still not yet uh, over with, with the pandemic and you know there's still more challenge ahead but thank you for dnr and open up and working with uh, our you know uh, citizen our park and you know our outdoors enthusiasts so thank you and good job thank you um and uh, commissioner meyer i i really appreciate the fact that um Commissioner Stroman came and in, this is a new format for us and for us to um, be able to really meet all the uh, division directors has been really, I think, informational for not only this committee, but those uh, folks wa uh, watching. Um, I think it's important to, to know all the pieces of the puzzle when we just say DNR, um, there's so much more to it. Um, and so thank you all for, for coming here today. It was uh, very informative and really appreciative. And with that, members, um, there being no more business be in front of our committee, uh, we are adjourned. And thank you. It's wonderful to see you all. Thank you.